I have started the recording, so um, watch what you say. There are people still trickling in one by one. Um, and I don't see Stefan, so maybe I'll wait for a minute or two. Minute, maybe. Maybe we can start with the announcements. A uh, couple of things. One is, of course, the antitrust policy of Hyperledger, which uh, is the only requirement for people uh, to join the meeting. And it's an open meeting. And I was told that the link I had in my in the LinkedIn was uh, wrong, but I had since corrected it. So hopefully people will um, trickle in. Uh, the second point is that uh, we have to abide by the Hyperledger Code of Conduct, which uh, necessitates us to be nice behave so even when we are disagreeing with people uh, we should not be uh, disagreeable that is the second uh, point uh, that's about it but uh, let me introduce uh, the people who are here as you know uh, the i see stefan connecting so uh, hopefully he'll be here soon uh, one of the most interesting uh, things about Europe is that because they are a collection of states, um, they are forced to deal with many of the issues of collaboration. Uh, and as you know, GDPR is highly influential. Uh, they had started this uh, unification or sort of a uh, assurance level approach to national identity systems uh, in 2014. And uh, Stefan had pro also presented about this before, but I, I believe the latest uh, addition is very important because it will, it will also be highly influential and specifically the identity wallet uh, work that is in the latest EI DAS is very, uh, is bound to be influential. So the three people here that are going to make a presentation, one is Stefan, who's, uh, who I've known from, um, from my work at BNP Pariba uh, is now, the head of SGM Consulting, and he is also a member of many committees that are set up uh, as part of the EIDAS effort, and he is also a known expert in identity and identity, uh, you know, KYC, AML, and so on. The other person that I want to talk about is Luca Bolden, who's um, uh, yeah, he, he is uh, the, yeah, Stefan, I can see the screen. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. So Luca is a member of, uh, R&D member of InfoCert, also a practitioner uh, of the latest, I mean, he's, he has to obey the regulations of the European Union. The third person here is also deeply steeped in um, uh, in the practice, so he's an expert. Uh, Roland uh, from Aero Suerte, Surete, uh, which is a company that works with uh, compliance aspects of the logistics uh, supply chain logistics. Uh, so he is also watching EI DAS closely because that will affect his work a lot. Uh, having said that, I think I should just retreat into the background and let uh, 
Stefan or uh, however they want to drive the presentation forward. And of course, there will be uh, time for questions. Okay, um, <clears throat> Vipin, I'm trying to um, make my video work, but it doesn't seem to be possible. Is that normal? Uh, I Maybe don't. Not. I mean, mind you, it's, I'm not sure there's much to see. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the presentation is very important. I... Okay, then let's let's remain with the presentation. So, thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, indeed, this is. Uh, this is a team effort, okay? So there are three of us uh, and that's uh, certainly needed for this important piece of, uh, of news that has been published, uh, released uh, about a couple of weeks ago now. Um, uh, what you should know, I know a lot of uh, participants are not from, the, from Europe, but if you are in the uh, European region, uh, EIDAS is all important, um, <clears throat> and you're, if you're interested in digital identity, um, EIDAS is the by far the most important piece of regulation you must know about. Um, the reason is that it's still the you know it's still the only international uh, uh, regulation that uh, organizes the mutual um, um, admission of digital identities on a cross-border basis. So that's uh, now uh, what uh, did happen two weeks ago, and that was a combination of um, consulta consultation efforts that took uh, nearly a year. Um, was that um, the EIDAS re regulation has been um, uh, is going to be amended. Um, so we're talking here about EIDAS 2. It's not the official terminology, but I think it's it really uh, is uh, easier to um, uh, to uh, to understand. So what's uh, what's EIDAS 2? And I think we have uh, there's three of us, and we we thought we might uh, think uh, you know three chapters or three parts, so to speak. First. Uh, uh, why is the IDAS2 talking about identity wallets? Uh, then uh, uh, Luca, that I'm going to take short of that. Luca is going to be um, involved in a discussion uh, uh, between uh, about the SSI concepts uh, and EIDAS2, and I hope I to her learn a lot on that. And uh, last but not least, uh, Roland is going to focus on a number of questions. As you will see, there are still plenty of questions uh, that, are, that can be uh, can be asked. Uh, we don't have there. Are, we we can offer a few answers, but there are a lot more that are uh, uh, to be uh, you know remain to be to be to be uh, considered. So why is EIDAS two talking about digital identity wallets? Uh, that's the first question. Maybe before oops. Um, yeah, uh, before we move into EIDAS 2, you have to understand that EIDAS 2 comes after EIDAS 1, which is, uh, which is pretty basic. Um, EIDAS 1 has been in place for seven years now. Uh, it was officially published in 2014. Uh, so this is an EU regulation that applies to across all uh, EU countries. In fact, it's a little bit wider than EU countries. It's the European economic area um, uh, itself, which includes Norway and, uh, and another uh, few other countries. Um, it has, it, and, and it's important to, real, to, to realize that it contains two pillars, uh, which are only partially integrated. One is uh, so-called trust services, um, addressed on the left, on the right side column here. Um, Typically what you're talking about is uh, electronic signatures and seals, uh, electronic register delivery services, timestamps, website authentication. These services are you know, fairly uh, defined in fairly, in fairly uh, comprehensive terms. There's nothing particularly, and hopefully uh, Luca is going to agree with me, I don't think there's anything remarkable in the IDAS regulation regarding trust services because what you find there is also to be found in other uh, regulatory frameworks. The important point, though, is to know that that trust, those trust services are fully open to the private sector and based on certification processes and open standards, which are mostly at sea standards. Okay, so what is critical for trust services providers is to get certified, and once they get certified, 
they can offer uh, the so-called recognized trust services defined there, and they can offer their, those throughout the EU, and they are recognized equally and directly into each every and every member state. Um, to put it very succinctly, the verdict there has been quite a success. Uh, I'm, it's it's uh, you know it's uh, it's there. You have about 250 uh, trust service providers. Uh, a lot of them are you know offering electronic signatures, of course, and uh, and timestamps, website authentications. On the other hand, uh, you have another pillar, which is uh, which is focusing on digital identity schemes. Um, here, you're talking about a completely different set of animals. Uh, here, you're talking about, uh, in fact, it's it's an international recognition, a mutual recognition framework of national identity schemes. Okay, so you you have to view it as a sort of international treaty recognizing, you know, the French, the German, the Italian, the Spanish uh, in, uh, uh, ID scheme. Um, and, and, and basically one of the key elements is that uh, there is a common uh, level of assurance framework defined. That's one of the major achievements of the EIDAS regulation. And there is uh, 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 an infrastructure that allows uh, the interoperability uh, of the uh, digital identities across the various member states. So technically, uh, a German ID can be used in France and vice versa, and in other countries, of course. Um, the result here is has been very mixed, and that's a little bit, that's even an understatement. Uh, only half of the member states have notified uh, a scheme to the to the EU Commission. One of the problem is that there is uh, only a very limited range of ID attributes that are available. And uh, on top of that, it is uh, the EIDAS uh, uh, scheme was uh, very focused on public services. In other words, uh, the private sector uh, was not really considered. It was it was mentioned here and there, but not really considered as a core uh, as a core uh, uh, focus. And uh, the result is not surprising. I mean, you have uh, extremely limited and at times no cross-border usage of those uh, national identities, even though they are technically recognized throughout the EU, they remain domestic uh, country by country uh, identities. So that is um, <clears throat> something that um, has been, uh, has been uh, uh, considered um, as uh, unsatisfactory, and as you well know, there has been a lot of development as well on the uh, SSI uh, since uh, 2014. Of course, there's been a lot of focus on SSI schemes. Uh, uh, you know the impact of uh, uh, distributed ledger technology, uh, blockchains, and and so forth. And uh, you know efforts were made to consider whether, in fact, uh, the SSI uh, framework, well, the EIDAS framework, was uh, compatible with the SSI. Uh, solutions. The answer has been uh, considered in a in a you know fairly landmark report published last year. But I'm afraid it's uh, if you go through the report, uh, you will see that it's uh, it, it really takes uh, a lot of adjustment to accommodate the uh, current EIDAS framework with SSI. Um, the 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 approach that has been taken was to say, look, uh, you know, we can't really live with that. We have to. Um, effectively amend the uh, EIDAS framework. And uh, a consultation process, as mentioned, was launched uh, nearly a year ago. Um, a number of options were submitted. Um, and uh, and uh, the, the draft proposal was released uh, two, two and a half weeks ago. Um, it is uh, expected, so it's a draft. Okay, so it's not a, it's not a final uh, regulation. It's a draft. It's expected to reach a study book next year uh, if everything goes well. I think it's likely, mind you. But um, so what it, what it does on the trust services side, it 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 builds on the current uh, architecture. It doesn't modify it, but just adds a list of. Uh, new trust services. And um, 
One of them which is interesting is electronic attestation of attributes, uh, which, uh, which include a range of uh, attributes that are not, were not considered so far, but uh, will include qualification titles and licenses and financial and company data. Um, and that is something that, of course, would be of interest to the financial sector as a whole. Um, on the um, digital identity scheme, uh, you still have the uh, current EID uh, framework, no major change. Uh, but in fact, you have a new uh, a newcomer, uh, which is the so-called European digital identity wallets. And these are uh, effectively attracting a lot of attention. Uh, what they are is our solution defined in, in uh, well, they are wallets that are defined in very broad terms. We have just provided on the slide the definition. Uh, what you should, uh, maybe a number of uh, 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 important features is that uh, they are issued or recognized by member states under their own responsibility. So don't necessarily assume that any kind of digital identity where it can certainly become EIDAS compliant and become recognized under EIDAS. This is not uh, what the solution is going to be. Uh, effectively, there will have to be some involvement of a member state. They will be like trust services, they will be certified. So there will be no more peer review. Um, there will be a common framework of uh, specification and standards applicable and effectively, every member state will be able to uh, notify uh, digital identity wallets that conform to the, uh, to the set of standards. They will be recognized fully across uh, the whole of Europe. Uh, very importantly, they will be recognized and they, they will be required to be accepted as alternatives to strong customer authentication mechanisms and they will have to be accepted by the so-called very large online platforms, which are effectively the, uh, the uh, Microsoft Connect, Google Connect, uh, um, and, and, and other GAFAs uh, SSI solutions. Um, and lastly, they will be free to use for the user, but at the same time, the operator of the wallet will not be in a position to, will be prohibited from uh, using any customer behavior data, okay? So they are going to be um, user-centric in that respect. Um, now, what you should also realize is that uh, there are a number of principles which are clear, but the fine prints are missing. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 um, there is a lot that remains to be uh, mentioned, detailed, uh, and only broad principles are available. And even those broad principles at times can be interpreted in different ways. So don't, uh, don't assume that we have a clear picture today because that's clearly not the case. Um, what, um, what is, uh, you know, we've highlighted on the slide and a number of principles that have gone through some of them and, uh, you know, a few others are that, uh, you know, the digital identity wallets will have to offer the highest level of security for the personal data and will have to comply with the EIDAS high LOA specification, which incidentally are quite challenging. I mean, they are in many ways compa uh, uh, comparable to the NIST uh, LOA, LOI three, if I, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, and, uh, the, the big difference between the, uh, so-called current, uh, digital identity schemes under the current EIDAS and the future digital identity wallets is that this time digital identity wallets are primarily targeting private sector quality use cases. Okay. So everything requiring strong authentication uh, will in fact be required to accept digital identity wallets and also the so-called very large online platforms as, as mentioned. Um, now, a lot, and when I say a lot, it really is a lot. A lot remains to be built uh, and decided for these, uh, for these wallets. Um, in fact, we don't know much more than what I've said earlier, so as you can as you can assume, there's still plenty to uh, 
plenty to, to work on. Um, basically, what, what has been suggested is in parallel with the um, uh, implementation process of the new regulation, there is going to be a co-construction co process called, defined as the common toolbox, uh, which was, is meant to effectively define uh, a common set of standards and, and, and specification on the provision of exchange of identity attributes on the functionality and securities of, uh, of wallets, on the reliance mechanisms of wallets and governance aspects. So everything dealing with the technical infra infrastructure, the common standards, everything is, is up to be decided yet. Hmm? Um, and, and for that, there is going to be, uh, in fact, an EIDAS expert group is, uh, is um, <clears throat> going to be set up. So everybody's already trying to uh, position themselves to take part in that. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, what, what is important to realize is that for anyone who has uh, an idea of a wallet or uh, a uh, proposal of a wallet, a digital identity wallet, will have to consider two key requirements. The first one is, of course, meeting the uh, common toolbox uh, 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 requirements, you know, the common uh, specifications that are going to be defined. That's obvious. But I'm afraid that's not the only requirement. The other requirement is to obtain the permission of a member state. And, and, and note that uh, because only member states can effectively qualify uh, digital identity wallets. And, and note that there is no right to obtain the approval of a member state. This is a pure discretionary decision. So who, uh, you know, one member state can approve one or more than one wallets, but you have uh, no, there are no rules defined and I think there will be no rules defined as to what are the criteria for um, uh, acceptance by member states of a wallet. So there, this leaves with uh, us with a number of, uh, of uh, I would say, uh, structural questions. Uh, the, one of the key uh, most interesting question is, um, okay, you have 27 member states in the Europe, in Europe they are all required within six months to notify or uh, a wallet, okay? Uh, uh, first of all, do they all need to, to notify a different wallet? I mean, can two member states approve the same wallet? Why not? I mean, probably not for large uh, member states, but for smaller member states that do not necessarily have the same, the, you know, the, the, the resources to do that, um, it would make sense to combine forces, so to speak. Um, and another topic that is, uh, that is uh, of relevance is uh, whether once you have a wallet in place, it, let's say, and uh, uh, take, a, take a, 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 a topical example, and it's the Estonian wallet. Estonia in Europe is known as a very digital friendly. So it's been a pioneer in uh, digital identity matters for a number of years. So they are going, the Estonian state is going to, not, to, to, to uh, effectively notify its own wallet. Now, it's a very small country. Um, there is a strong possibility that if you're a non-Estonian like me, uh, maybe you could, uh, you could benefit from that wallet if it, if it does, uh, you know, it, if it does bring value or if it does, uh, uh, it is relevant for you. Um, and the question is, uh, is it clear that uh, the EU citizens are given complete flexibility as to which wallet they can use? Uh, that even that is not completely uh, agreed. In fact, there's nothing that says no. I think it's likely to be yes, but uh, it's not absolutely confirmed. And uh, one last question maybe is, uh, can an industry wallet be considered, uh, for example, banks are um, and Luca, I'm sure you will confirm that, uh, you know, banks are saying, oh, you know, we have special needs, uh, we need our own wallet, uh, and, uh, you know, we can't uh, just rely on 27 different wallets for that. Um, so that's about it for me. Luca, your turn now. Thank you. I'll go, well, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll you hear me? The slides. Okay, uh, uh, thanks. Awesome. 
Yes, my, my focus will be on uh, trying to give my view, this is a personal perspective, on how this new regulation uh, comes uh, toward what we all are very familiar with, which is the SSI paradigm. Uh, a part of the fact of introducing an identity wallet, which is, uh, as we all know, an SSI concept. Uh, I think it's worth, uh, worthwhile understanding what, what's the, the, the main movement behind. So uh, this slide, well, th this is about starting from the, the pre-digital world. I'm sorry, I don't want to teach you <laughs> the, the basics of identity, but, but this is necessary for me to, to bring what to me is the main concept which uh, AI does version two is bringing. So in, uh, in the physical world, well, the problem that uh, well, we all <clears throat> need to deal with is when a person <clears throat> introduces himself at a different, uh, at some say office, say the, an airport and an office and wants to <clears throat> prove that he is some specific person and that he has some specific attributes we, uh, we do that via uh, paper uh, certificates and there are by different kinds of certificates. Uh, uh, the, the typical classifications that there are um, um, documents which bind a biometrics, a picture typically, but they may, might be digital fingerprint something to uh, a name. Well, a name is a, a set of attributes identifying the person. So name, family name, place of birth, etc. So th this is the first kind of things and this is normally referred to as an identity card. Then you also have a certificates which bind the name to specific attributes. Think of degree. In the degree, you're binding my name to the fact that uh, I'm a mathematician, would have a degree and whatever. Uh, and normally, if you want to prove in person to someone that you have some attribute, you need to present both the certificate, the degree certificate, and an identity card in order that the, they can join uh, using the name as the joining variable the, conceptually. But there's also a third way, which is the direct binding between biometric and attributes. Well, what you see in the picture is an Italian old fashioned driving license, which binds a, a photo with the fact that you can drive a car. Incidentally, it also brings the name, which is the, the identifier, but that would be not necessary principle. Uh, it might be simply association of some biometric attributes and the, the fact that you can drive. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> Stefan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. The same is happening in the in the in the digital world with some differences, and especially the differences are the fact that the name is substituted by an identifier, and the identifier might be a dumb identifier, or it might be even contain some some data like my Google identifiers, Luca.boldrain, which, which is not dumb. But, but normally the, this is dumb. So the, the name, the real name, which has legal value, is moved to the attribute side. So what, what you need are two things. One is binding the identifier to some authentication mean. And in the digital world, the authentication mean cannot be biometrics anymore. So we use some crypto techniques since you, you don't have the physical pres pres presence of the person to, to meet the face with, uh, or, or at least that's not sufficient in, in most cases. So there's a clear differ difference between the authentication part, which is proving that you are the owner of an identifier, and then the provision of trusted attributes which are related to this, uh, to this, this I insist on this point, since this is exactly where EIDAS 1 was very weak, since it made kind of messing up those concepts, uh, which are now being clarified with the introduction of the identity wallet. As you see in this picture, there's also a, a narrow linking authentication means directly to attributes. So 
uh, avoiding skipping the identifier, and that's very relevant to avoid traceability. But I want to insist on that since this is not really in the focus of the IDAS. It seems that um, the, this is not, not particularly relevant to, 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 to the, the, the new regulation. Oh, next slide, please, uh, Stefan. OK, so let us. Um, <clears throat> EIDAS 2 offer now a clear decoupling. So you, uh, uh, they will offer identity wallet, which might be used both for authentication and for the provision of trusted attributes. And they're clearly separated. EIDAS 1, as I was saying, in fact, was a bundle. You couldn't uh, take just one part of that. Authentication with EIDAS 1 meant that you had to provide your real name, your real family name, and so on. There's a set of core attributes which were necessary, implicit in the EIDAS authentication. This seems to me to be no more the case since the electronic digital identity wallet supports authentication as an independent feature. And this is some text from the regulation. So it says that, uh, for instance, very large online platform may use authentication with the digital identity wallet. And typically, uh, if you think of a very large online platform, which means Amazon, Google, and so on, they do not need necessary to, uh, to identify you. They are not asking for your real world identity. They are just asking you to authenticate. Uh, they uh, very often they do not care about trusted attributes. Sometimes they need, for instance, the case that when you need to prove that you are of age in order to uh, have some services and like. But most cases, they, they just well, Amazon just deal with your credit card number. Any other attributes can be fake. You can just declare it. So it appears that the digital identity wallet can be, or in fact, must be accepted also for pure authentication. And uh, yeah, the rest of the text is just uh, underlying this concept. The uh, relying party is able to authenticate the user and to receive then as a further step, electronic attestation. So next slide, Christopher. Yeah. Thanks so much. So um, there, there's a strong uh, focus on private sector, which as was mentioned by Stefan before, was not in the focus of the IDAS one. And in fact, it was one of the reasons for, for kind of a failure of the identity part in the IDAS one. Uh, and here you see that there's a, uh, there's a strong mention of re private relying party providing services, the area of transport, energy, banking, financial services, security, et cetera, education, telecommunication, they should accept the use of the digital identity wallet. Uh, in this case, uh, it is where strong user authentication for online identification is required. Since some services, regulated services, like I think uh, provisioning of telco services need to identify you. But this is also required, as we already mentioned, when authenticate, where only authentication is required. This is the, 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 the example of a very large online platform. Okay, next one. So uh, we covered authentication until now. This is about uh, provisioning of trusted attributes, which is the other, the other arrow in the, in, the, in the triangle, the upper arrow. And the, this is, uh, again, something really new since the uh, electronic digital identity wallet does not only support a limited set of attributes, but it should be open to, uh, uh, as it says in the text, the current EIDAS framework does not cover provision of electronic attributes, which are required both by uh, public services and private services. Moreover, there's a selective disclosure as a requirement. So the user must be able to decide which attributes to provide, which is only partially the case uh, in present days of regulation. And in fact, 
<clears throat> present day regulation, uh, the, the set of attributes which are managed are very limited and there's very limited choice on what you can and what you, what you want to provide and what you don't want to provide. Okay, and the next one. There's an additional step which is introduced in uh, AI das Vuchu, which is the electronic attestation of attribute. This concept is fairly new and um, to some extent it uh, differs from, from the traditional SSI vision where you have a issuer and you have a, a holder and a verifier. In fact, there's a, the, they introduced the concept of electronic attestation of attributes and qualified electronic attestation of attributes, which means uh, if you read the clause 45, uh, an electronic attestation of attributes, which is issued by a qualified trust service provider. Qualified trust service provider, as Stefan mentioned before, was the second pillar of the IDAS. So we are now in the field where there's some intermediary qualified trust service provider are private entities, uh, uh, commercial uh, companies that provide services like time stamping, digital signature and the like, and there's now a role for these providers to attest attributes. Uh, we normally in this SSI, um, and it also may happen that they uh, have a role in the validation of attributes. This attribute validation is the other aspect which should be covered. If we go to the next and I think final slide, uh, well, uh, you may have seen this, this picture in some different fashion since this, this comes from uh, the ONX, the, the Canadian initiative. Um, but, but here the, uh, I introduced the TSP in the middle. So you see there's an issuer. The issuer doesn't give credential to the holder. Credentials go to a TSP who's in charge of provider attestation. And then the attested attributes goes to the holder. This is my understanding of how the flow works. And this has especially been conceived in my, in my view to solve an issue which we have uh, in a, typically when, when dealing with the identity wallet, which is how can I trust the issuer? This was simple in the digital world since in, this, in the digital world, when you have a paper EID document well, you easily recognize it by the features of the document. And there are very few uh, possible providers of uh, this kinds of document, the, the university, uh, the, uh, some state agencies, some healthcare agencies, and you normally know which kind of documents they provide. So validation of the document is provided simply by looking at the, at the, at the document itself of the physical characteristics of the document, some specific, uh, say, watermarking uh, or whatever. This is a way validation happened up to now. Uh, in the digital world, this is a problem. Since when you have a large number of issuers, how can I trust the issuer? Here, the concept of trust framework, etc. cetera, there's long, long discussion on this. The European way of, for this seems to go through specialized entities, which collect attributes and attest attributes. So in the end, the verifier simply needs to trust the attester, not the issuer. It's quite different. And it is based on the, the history of the IDA since, uh, which normally was based around the concept of trust provider service list and so on. Uh, well, we'll see whether this is really something which applies to, to real world necessities. But um, to me, th this is the way they are, they are putting it. And I think this closes my presentation. So I'll give the floor now to uh, Roland. Thank you so much, uh, Luca. Uh, my view is um, um, based on prospective because um, as, you, as far as you can understand, um, all the, um, the project is not completely clear and completely written. And I would want to point out um, 
the, the main points that can give you um, relevant information in order to, to be able to act um, and to, to be um, sometimes force of proposal uh, relating to this uh, regulation. Firstly, I would uh, say that um, electronic digital identity wallets uh, project appears to be both um, um, an official national electronic proof of the, the identity, which uh, um, as uh, explained um, uh, Stefan, um, really based on um, a sovereign approach. While we should um, precise this word, because uh, EU Commission um, is coordinating um, a very large number of um, member states, which are on their own really uh, responsible and uh, of their prerogative. And of course, um, identity management, which is, uh, as explained Luca, currently managed with uh, real life uh, ID cards uh, is a key um, subject for them. I would want to add uh, on the, the main points um, that, um, there, that there will be um, a, um, a real challenge uh, between um, this uh, project of uh, electronic uh, digital identity wallets um, with the, the, the way um, they, they will be um, negotiated and um, I, will, I would say on board it um, with the large um, SSI providers, including large platforms as GAFAS, but also um, over uh, SSI, SSI um, uh, solution providers, such as uh, uh, Epologist impl implementers. And then at the end, I would want to stress the fact that for many um, European, um, I would say, um, commission and uh, people who uh, are quite of um, uh, importance in um, uh, EU um, management, um, this project uh, of digital uh, identity wallets appears to be a first step to another big subject, which is a di digital currency for the euro. Some of our um, famous digital currency uh, already exists. There are some other uh, famous um, digital uh, currency projects that uh, Vipin, you, you have already uh, presented. Uh, and um, today, um, the, the rumors, and this is of course non-official, this must be read under the, under, between the lines, but uh, for many uh, uh, people who are deciding things in uh, the European community, um, this is a first step towards uh, digital currency uh, for the euro. Um, please, Stefan, can you turn the slide? Another um, open point, of, including the first uh, announcement, is um, the requirement for uh, GAFAS, for large platforms like Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook, uh, to accept the use of the EU digital identity wallets upon request of the user, as could be explained. And uh, for example, for um, edge proof, um, according to uh, access to uh, any service, uh, which is, uh, for example, um, uh, bargaining online. Um, we have, uh, I've used the, the word sovereign line um, because um, it's linked to um, the, um, I would say, uh, European um, um, community structure based on uh, um, states uh, which are their own uh, sovereign uh, requirements. But 
according to this context, uh, uh, we of course have to uh, face some challenges, uh, which uh, are quite important. And um, the one um, appears to be um, uh, that European digital identity wallets could be both um, a huge opportunity for uh, SSI uh, providers um, or um, in a, um, a pessimistic uh, approach, um, a threat. And um, I uh, want to open uh, the discussion uh, on these uh, um, two um, possible uh, aspects um, in order to uh, uh, understand the complexity of the, the subject. Uh, thirdly, I uh, would want to stress the fact that uh, onboarding, onboarding strategies uh, will uh, be a real trick uh, for uh, our uh, chief technical officers. And um, there is, there is a real question of um, um, governance and that has to be uh, said. Uh, for example, um, will it be, um, who will be the master? Will, will it be uh, the European digital identity wallets uh, to the, give uh, the onboarding master for uh, fourth party? Uh, or uh, is the third party uh, um, onboarding will be um, validated uh, by uh, uh, the um, national authority, which is uh, designed to be uh, uh, the um, referee of uh, the, the market. Um, and at an end, will a sovereign, sovereign line um, will be strictly confirmed um, or in the other end, could be a delegation um, of the system under the control um, uh, of the, uh, each member states. And of course, uh, with uh, uh, each, uh, with a real coordination of the commission. I think that um, this uh, situation is uh, quite similar uh, to a subject um, I've, I practice every day um, is the, um, the worldwide rules which have to be applied to avoid bombs in planes. After 9-11, uh, there was a very huge uh, request for security, of course, uh, um, on all uh, uh, airlines. And uh, there was a big um, rush of, of every actors uh, to build the best uh, tool and the best regulation in order to uh, uh, fit uh, this, this need, which is, was crucial. And there, uh, there, there happens to be an international uh, organization, which is International Civil Association uh, Organization, ICAO, which um, um, was both um, a, a big club for all the, the, the states who were the members, firstly. Um, and this club uh, could uh, arrange uh, an, a worldwide set of standards and could also be um, the um, inspirator of uh, each national um, regulation. And at an end, ICAO was to um, uh, um, um, an authority who was able to audit each national authority on this uh, uh, subject. Um, please, Stefan, could you turn the slide? At the end, I um, wanted to stress the fact that uh, IDS uh, expert group will uh, be tasked uh, in the European community uh, and will be uh, open uh, to discussion with stakeholders and um, will uh, be the interlocutor for uh, all the stakeholders for the purposes of implementing. And uh, I think it's a huge opportunity to, uh, to have discussion um, uh, at this uh, level uh, in order to um, uh, build, uh, of course, common standards. Um, then there's also 
um, in the regulation um, 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 a point which um, allows operators to, uh, uh, um, I would say, reuse uh, some existing uh, um, working frameworks. That's the reason why IES uh, one and uh, uh, particularly um, new, new concepts uh, of uh, catalogs of uh, attributes and, and schemes could be um, uh, reused in order to uh, provide interoperability, inter inter it's hard to say, um, as an end and to uh, finally open um, the debate. I would say that um, international mutual recognition between uh, all the, um, the authorities and all the stakeholders should be questioned that can be uh, asked um, to the community and that uh, probably will uh, have uh, uh, an impact on uh, the um, included in the toolbox process explained by, by uh, Stefan uh, on this uh, expert group or uh, ideas which is um, I, I think the place to be uh, in order to uh, uh, give um, uh, an impact and uh, an overview uh, of uh, stakeholders' um, requirements um, on, the, on this regulation. Thank you. Beautiful. I think um, if there is uh, some time for questions. Uh, I already see a couple of questions in the, you know, in the in the chat. One of which is uh, for Stefan. What was the rationale? Uh, this is by uh, Brett uh, McDowell from Hedera. What is the rationale for EIDAS credentials being accepted as an alternative to SCA? Does EIDAS require equivalent requirements or is it a backdoor mechanisms for national IDs to be weaker than what PSD2 and SCA require? Uh, Stefan, if you can answer that, that'd be great. Otherwise, um... yeah. If I if I, if I can be blunt and direct, uh, and forgive me for that, I think it has a lot to do with the requirement with the uh, with the desire to ensure that uh, digital identity wallets are are uh, accepted everywhere. And because, as as mentioned by Luca, they include they can be used as authentication solutions. Um, they should become uh, the uh, choice, the preferred choice for uh, whenever you need a strong authentication solution. Beautiful. Um, now, Diane has his hand up, so I'm sure he has questions. Yeah, uh, thanks. And it, it ties into the, to your last point on strong identity uh, authentication. Um, you know, so, um, and EIDAS unfortunately only has uh, three levels uh, of uh, assurance that they define, and they don't do what um, ISO or NIST does and separate authenticator assurance level and identity assurance level or federation assurance level for that matter. Um, and I mentioned that because the way that you do get the strongest levels of authenticator assurance is, um, Either um, a supervised remote or in person. So I, you know, so I don't agree that you could get really strong authentication with this because you can prove that you're in possession of this. Unfortunately, what they uh, uh, the solution that they are legislating a wallet. They, I don't agree with that. But anyhow, that's a different subject. So to get strong authentication, how are you binding that? To, to the person based on something that they know. And that doesn't get you the strongest level of authenticator assurance. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm able to answer that question, but um, uh, what I can tell you is that I've, I'm also working on the, uh, as part of the FC standardization uh, process, which effectively is looking precise, is defining standards precisely on that nature, uh, on that topic, and and uh, uh, we are effectively within Etsy, we're effectively defining new requir requirements for 
uh, identity proofing that will be linked to the trust services and that will indirectly be linked to the uh, to the digital identity wallets. So classically, yes. Yeah. Um, we have the three uh, routes, right? One is what you are, what you have, and what you know. Uh -huh. um, so any identity scheme that uh, builds on each one of them uh, collectively, uh -huh. meaning, meaning if you have a set of attributes that are uh, somehow established with these three methods together rather than one or the other, Mm -hmm. uh, then that would be obviously stronger than just one. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and Dan's point, I guess, is uh, in terms of current EIW, EIDW uh, regulation. I didn't realize it was only for something that you know, not, yeah. oh, not oh, other. That bear in mind that uh, the strong authentication requirement is uh, is a requirement that is um, mostly used, I would say, for the uh, within the financial sector for the payment systems. Um, so in Europe, I don't know if it applies the same way in the U.S., but if you are effectively making an online payment above a certain threshold, you are the bank is technically required to use strong authentication, and if it doesn't. It can still do it, but it has uh, complete, uh, you know, it's in a much weaker position legally. Um, so I think what the, coming back to the original question, whenever that, uh, I would say, banking regulatory requirement kicks in, effectively what the intent here, and I'm not saying it's perfect and it's uh, fully ironed up, but the intent is clearly to say, look, instead of, say, of using your usual strong authentication credentials that you would typically use for the, uh, when you're interacting with your financial service provider, you could use the digital identity wallet for that specific purpose. How that will apply, that's still, I, I, you know, there are pretty, I, you know, there are a lot of things that still need to be worked out, but that is intent effectively. It looks like yeah. uh, it looks like uh, Brett has got his. I mean, Dan, did you get your question answers? By the yeah, way, no, Brett has his hand up. But no, lots more to discuss on this. But yeah, to to be fair, let's uh, have Brett chime in. Yeah, so this is just a recommendation. I mean, the industry worked very hard with European Banking Authority and DG FISMA on SCA requirements. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that they can be reused here. I think that is highly advisable. Uh, yeah. It was literally years of, of debate. Well, I, that is that is a certainly that is a concern. You know, I can't talk for the European Commission because I'm not, you know, I'm I'm not mandated for that purpose. But what I know from discussion with the European Commission people, especially DG Fisma, and happen to be a contractor of DG Fisma, is they are acutely aware of the fact that they should not try to reinvent every wheel. Okay. And if there are good uh, international standards that are existing out there, uh, it would be a lot more simpler, more efficient, and more productive to use them. So they have no, um, don't, I mean, don't assume they, they, are, they are fully aware of the need to reuse uh, existing standards and protocols that can be reused. Beautiful. Uh the one of the things that seems to be uh, missing in this whole debate, so to say, is the uh, that simplicity. Like, for example, uh, you know, if you take uh, the digital ledger payment commitment, which is a uh, initiative uh, that has come out of WEF and all that, uh, just with thirteen attributes or so, you can uh, perfect an instrument that is valid uh, for a digital signature and for a payment commitment. But obviously the identity part is, uh, you know, deals mostly with the signatures and so on. But uh, the aim should be to be able to uh, get the highest level of assurance even with uh, limited uh, attributes because uh, I mean, it is not the attributes themselves. Uh, I mean, like people say that with about three or four or even 
a few attributes, you can actually accurately uh, place a person. I mean, it is only the level of assurance that attaches to those attributes that are uh, more important than anything else. Pippin, may I um, give a short answer? Yes. This is a question of trust. And um, the real um, element in trust is that you have to certify all the elements of the chain and that you have a, a system with updating constantly um, in any risk of breach um, um, by um, acting immediately and um, closing the, the, the issue. And that's the reason why uh, I believe that um, the, the question of, um, re relevant of, of uh, certification uh, should apply on uh, every um, actor of the, the, this chain of trust. That's my, my point of view. And that's the reason why uh, we, we should, um, uh, of course, comply uh, all um, in um, uh, a common standard of uh, um, requirements in order to, to provide this trust. Stepan, uh, you have anything more to add on that or? No, I think it's, um, I mean, it, it, it's. Yeah, we, we could no. go on. <laughs> uh, I mean, it can go on forever. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's certainly generating that uh, whole debate and the announcement has been generating a lot of attention in Europe. Uh, it certainly is one of the landmark announcements in terms of, uh, in, in the field of digital identity. Um, and uh, um, everybody's talking about that. If you have uh, some interest in this uh, next week, uh, marking in fact, uh, to the day, the fifth uh, uh, anniversary of the launch of the EIDAS regulation, there's a, a fairly substantial uh, digital summit called Go EIDAS, um, where uh, including people from the European Commission will talk. So they, if you want to know more, that's, uh, I would suggest you, 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 you may uh, consider that. Um, another thing that also is worth uh, mentioning maybe that uh, there is a second announcement that is not specifically related to EIDAS but clicks into fairly neatly, fairly neatly with that is the uh, new uh, AML regulation uh, that, is, uh, that will effectively supersede the current AML directive uh, in other, in, and that will aim to ensure uh, a, great, a much greater level of KYC and CDD data unification or harmonization across member states. So that is more specific to the financial sector, no doubt, um, but it will leverage the use of, it's expected to leverage the use of the uh, EIDAS uh, regulation into the financial sector, which as we know is, is quite critical anyhow. Thank you guys. I mean if I may make yeah. a short remark on some um, notes that please, are showing please. in the chat. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, I guess that that's true that well, uh, credentials should be in my wallet that are not necessarily part of my national EID. But uh, as I see it, in fact, this is, uh, well, it's kind of a strange move since uh, uh, the, the commission is moving in the, in the field of providing a, a say a general purpose authentication tool which is something additional with respect to the national id i fully agree and this general purpose I, authentication tool which works as a wallet uh, well uh, should form would form a say kind of a basis to uh, to promote interoperability this is behind what uh, a commission uh, will would have the mandate to do. This is not, not just doing something on the identity level. They are adopting tools in support of authentication, which is something that some commercial identity uh, company could do as well. I think of Google Authenticate and the like. Uh, on the other side, uh, we must think, <clears throat> well, uh, why does the need of, uh, that this authentication tool goes through national member states? This is a bit strange and I think since this could have been done as a, yes, just one single tool, it might be even be adopted by Samsung, by whoever, just by one and that's done. 
And I think that has to do with um, well, political issues since uh, you know the identity issues are very sensitive. Member states want to have some kind of control. So to me, this is kind of a compromise toward from the necessity of having something general purpose on one side and, uh, and the requirement to maintain some kind of national sovereignty on the identity uh, concept. Uh, yeah, that's very true. I, I agree completely. Yeah. yeah, and so there is a difference between what is called uh, the genesis uh, identity, like your birth certificate or your, you know, that is completely controlled by the, by the state. And all these others are uh, accretions that add on things. And so there is a qualitative difference. Right, right. In, in the, yeah, especially developing industries like World Bank, we define that as foundational versus functional identity. Foundational identity is, is that core, some people call it legal identity, uh, like the, the UN uh, versus functional. And that's one of the things that Estonia did, as, as the folks said on this call, and that's where EIDIS comes from, basically Estonia. The first thing they legislated in 2000 was that uh, digital si signatures are as good as uh, ink signatures. And then they had their national ID two years later. Anyhow, the EI, uh, so in Estonia, the Estonian government issues that foundational identity, and then everything else is functional. Your voting, your health, your, you know, any of those are functional identities. And in Estonia, they legislate, the law says the government cannot ask for the same identity information more than once. That's why if you give your, if you have your foundational identity, your first name, last name, date of birth, registered with the, with the government, when you go to vote, they cannot ask for that information again. That's part of your foundational identity. So that must have some uh, ramifications in the debates happening here in the United States. Uh, um, but, you know, we are, we are in a peculiar position here because of the federated nature of the uh, government, but at the same time, we have this dual uh, thing going on, the state's rights versus the federal rights. And, uh, you know, the health certificates, uh, the uh, not health certificates, sorry, the, uh, the birth certificates are a local matter and the foundational uh, identifiers are established at the local level, then they propagate to the national level. So, you know, there's all kinds of uh, stuff about this and it's uh, some, um, you know, we, we, we can like uh, Stefan noted, we can keep talking about this for a, for a long time, but it's been a very uh, good discussion so far. And I think we should continue some of this. And of course, uh, Dan, who's a member of the uh, uh, TOIP knows the debates going on there, I'm sure Luca too. Uh, anyway, my, it's not the story. Huh? It's uh, it's uh, it's only starting now. In fact, <laughs> well, it's always uh, since life is a continuous journey, it's yeah. always a sto story half told, uh, and I think the Greeks recognized it a long time ago. Until you, until the day you die, you cannot say you're a happy man. Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway, so uh, I take, uh, you know, I, I'm taking so much information in that I, I have to write a, a piece on interoperability for the digital currency global initiative. And mm -hmm. one of the foundational aspects of interoperability of uh, any, uh, any type of silo, including digital currency is identity. So identity and it's, you know, the it's basically just going to be a suggestion for standardization, not standards themselves. So we take lessons from all of this. And thank you for showing up and talking about this very yeah. important subject. Either. If there's uh, if there's interest in uh, getting access to the doctor to the slideshow, I'm happy to yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I, but that is another thing I was meaning to ask you. We should uh, put in the slides in the in the wiki page so that anyone can have access to this. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, guys.
Yeah, yeah thank, thanks. Uh, it's been very helpful. And I, I did put in the uh, the chat, like we're doing a similar thing uh, via NOTPA, you know, providing feedback to, um, you know, to the to the EIDAS legislation. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'll participate in that. But as, as you guys pointed out, the, they're they're looking for public comment. Um, so, yeah, anybody on this call, I guess, could provide comment. Uh, I'll do so through it in NAPA, but I really appreciate this. Uh, yeah. And, and as you said, there's a lot unknown, but um, there's enough to uh, uh, in that legislation for us collectively to provide some feedback. Indeed. OK, thanks. Uh, thank Much you. Love. And uh, wonderful. We'll uh, we'll meet again. OK, uh, thanks. Later. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Not there.